BFG, The Big Friendly Giant by Roald Dahl. Chapter Who? W-H-O question mark. It wasn't a human. It couldn't be. It was four times as tall as the tallest human. It was so tall, its head was higher than the upstairs windows of the house. Sophie opened her mouth to scream, but no sound came out. Her throat, like her whole body, was frozen with fright. This was the witching hour, all right. The tall black figure was coming her way. It was keeping very close to the houses across the street, hiding in the shadowy places where there was no moonlight. On and on it came, nearer and nearer, but it was moving in spurts. It would stop and it would move on and then it would stop again. But what on earth was it doing? Aha. Uh -huh. Sophie could see now what it was up to. It was stopping in front of each house. It would stop and peer into the upstairs windows of each house in the street. It actually had to bend down to peer into the upstairs windows. That's how tall it was. Peer, P-E-E-R. In this instance, peer means to look. We have peers. Those are the people who are like us, that are similar to us. But in this instance, P-E-E-R, that means to look, to peer into or out of a window. It would stop and peer in. Then it would slide onto the house next to it and stop again and peer in and so on and so forth. It was much closer now, and Sophie could see more clearly. Looking at it clearly, she decided it had to be some kind of person. Obviously, it was not a human, but it was definitely a person, a giant person. Sophie stared hard across the misty, moonlit street. The giant, if that's what he was, was wearing a long black cloak. A cloak is like a big coat draping over you. In one hand, he was holding what looked like a very long, thin trumpet. On the other hand, he held a large suitcase. The giant had stopped now right in front of Mr. and Mrs. Gucci's house. The Gucci's had a green grocery shop in the middle of the high street, and the family lived above the shop. The two Gucci children slept in the upstairs front room. Sophie knew that. The giant was peering through the window into the room where Michael and Jane Gucci were sleeping. From across the street, Sophie watched and held her breath. All the way, please. She saw the giant step back and pace, step back a pace, and put the suitcase down on the pavement. He bent over and opened the suitcase and took something out of it. It looked like a glass jar, one of those square ones with a screw top. He unscrewed the top of the jar and poured it into the end of the long trumpet thing. Sophie watched trembling. She saw the giant straighten up again and she saw him poke the trumpet in through the upstairs window of the room where the Gucci children were sleeping. She saw the giant take a deep breath and <gasps> he blew through the trumpet. No noise came out, but it was obvious to Sophie that whatever had been in that jar had been blown through the trumpet 
to the Gucci children. What could it be? As the giant withdrew the trumpet from the window and bent down to pick up the suitcase, he happened to have turned his head and glanced across the street. Glances to take a quick look like this. I just glanced over there. In the moonlight, Sophie caught a glimpse of an enormous, long, pale, wrinkly finger with the most enormous ears. The nose was as sharp as a knife, and above the nose were two little bright flashlight eyes, and in the eyes were star staring straight at Sophie. They made eye contact. There was a fierce and devilish look about them. Sophie gave a yelp and pulled back from the window. She flew across the dormitory and jumped into her bed and hid under her cur blankets. And there she crouched as still as a mouse, tingling all over. I don't know if you can see it. It's very dark. He's very tall. He blows his trumpet thing filled with something. I can't see it though. Into the bedroom window. The snatch. <gasps> dun dun dun. Under the blanket, Sophie waited. After a minute or so, she lifted the corner of the blanket and peeped out. For a second time that night, her blood froze to ice and she wanted to scream, but no sound came out. <gasps> there in the window with the, no, with the curtains pushed aside was the enormous, long, pale, wrinkly face of the giant person staring in. The flashing black eyes were fixed on Sophie's bed. Fixed on Sophie's bed. They're just looking. She's just got, he's got his eyes stuck on her. Time, Sophie really did scream, but only for a second because a very large, quick, a very quick, bleh, because very quickly the huge hand clamped down over her blanket and the scream was smothered by the bedclothes. Sophie, crouching underneath the blanket, felt strong fingers grasping a hold of her, and then she was lifted up from her bed, the blanket and all, and whisked out of the window. <gasps> it's an orphan napping. If you can think of anything more terrifying than that, then let's hear about it. The awful thing was that Sophie knew exactly what was going on, although she couldn't see it happen. She knew that a monster or giant with enormous long pale wrinkly face and dangerous eyes had plucked her from her bed in the middle of the witching hour and was now carrying her out through the window, smothered in a blanket. What actually happened next was this. When the giant got Sophia outside, he arranged the blanket so that it, he could grasp all four corners of it once, at once in his huge hand with Sophie imprisoned inside. In the other hand, he seized, that means he took it over, the suitcase and the long trumpet and off he ran. So let's do a little demonstration. Here's the giant's hand. The giant's hand. He grabs the child in the blanket. 
and then he fixes it so that he doesn't have to hold it this way. He holds it, and there goes the child. Sorry, Dad. I dropped the child. I dropped the child. That was a bad example of a child. I'll grab a different child. How about this one? Is this a good child? That's more like the giant, right? So here's the child in the bed, grabbing the child. He takes the child in the blanket, and all four pieces of the blanket are like this. So he can hold his trumpet thing in one hand with his suitcase, and he can hold the child in the blanket, captured. What's that? Yeah. Yep. Do you need something? Have a seat safely. Sophie, by squirming around inside the blanket, managed to push the top of her head out through the little gap just below the giant's hand. She stared around her. She saw the village houses rushing by on both sides. The giant was sprinting down High Street. He was running so fast, his black cloak was streaming out behind him, like wings of a bird. Whoa. Each stride that he took was as long as a tennis court. One, out of the village he ran, and soon they were racing across the moonlit fields. The hedges divided the fields, were no problem to the giant. He just strode over them. A wide river appeared in his path. He crossed it in one flying stride. Sophie crouched in the blanket, peering outside. She was being bumped against the giant's leg like a sack of potatoes. Over the fields and hedges and rivers they went, and after a while a frightened thought came onto her. The giant was running fast, she told herself, because he is hungry and he wants to get home as quickly as possible, and then he will have me for breakfast. <sighs> well, just knowing what we know about stories, do you think the giant is going to eat her? No, no. No, but he did steal her in the middle of the night. Is this a true story? No. 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 Yeah. No. no. Oh, it's a giant. Oh, that is so cool. It looks exactly like Simon Head. I told you. It is not a true story. All right. Tomorrow we will read the cave. So what we know is that she was a wide awake, peering out the window. Saw the dragon, he saw her, they made eye contact. The next chapter is called The Cave. See you tomorrow.